Welcome to the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute Distinguished Lecture Series on the campus of UC San Diego. The OSHA Institute presents approximately 40 classes each quarter from history, literature, medicine, science and technology, writing workshops, music, art, and theater world, which presents live productions. For further information, please visit our website at OLLI dot UCSD dot edu. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Clancy Bonds, the coordinator of the Distinguished Lecture Series. Clancy? The OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute is pleased and privileged today to bring Dr. Richard Somerville to speak to us as a distinguished lecturer. Professor, Professor Somerville indeed holds the actual title at UCSD of distinguished professor at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at UC San Diego. He works and teaches in the Climate Research Division and the Center for Atmospheric Sciences at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. The title of his distinguished lecture today is Global Warming, Climate Change Science versus Public Policy. Dr. Somerville is an expert on global climate change and is a specialist in the computer modeling of the climate system. His extensive research includes studies of the predictability of climate. He is also the author of a critically acclaimed award-winning popular book entitled The Forgiving Air, Understanding Environmental uh, Debate. This book was written for the general public and covers issues such as the ozone loss and human-induced uh, human climate change. In addition to his work as a researcher and author of many scientific papers, Dr. Somerville is active in science education. He has testified before Congress. He's briefed UN climate change negotiators and advised a number of federal agencies. It is with great pleasure that I introduce uh, to you today a climate scientist who is not only a climate scientist, but a unique teacher and author, and who is in the forefront of the defense of the planet. Please welcome Dr. Richard Somerville. Well, the topic today is one that uh, changes almost by the hour. And uh, so for the record, I'll say it's December 1, 2006, and something extraordinary happened this week, which was that the U.S. Supreme Court heard oral arguments on a case involving climate change. Uh, the, the case is technical and complicated, but it has to do with whether the Environmental Protection Agency should be able to regulate carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas because they regulate air pollutants. And the, uh, the case was made that in the absence of regulation of greenhouse gases, uh, states and individuals will suffer damage, for example, through loss of coastline due to rising sea level. And so I thought I would uh, read to you an, a part of a, of a special document that was submitted as a friend of the court, an amicus brief, by a group of prominent climate scientists who intended to summarize for the justices the uh, relevant current state of climate science. It's very pertinent because the topic today, as you can see, is this constant tension and push between the science and the public policy related to climate change. So here's some of what this group said. They spoke in very carefully calibrated language. So the word uh, virtually certain, that term means greater than 99% chance of being true. Uh, very likely means it's 90% uh, it's uh, <coughs> or above. Likely better than two out of three and so on. Over the last two centuries, I'm quoting, it is virtually certain that human activities have increased the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to a level not seen in all of human experience and likely not seen for at least three million years. The average global surface temperature has risen. Human activities likely cause most of the approximately 1.1 degree Fahrenheit rise over the 20th century. Sea level has risen one-third to two-thirds of a foot over the 20th century. Snow cover and ice extent in the Arctic has decreased by about 10% and 25% respectively since the late 60s. 
And it is very difficult to find global scale uh, measures of climate that indicate cooling. And they go on then to say that uh, in the absence of emissions reductions, that is, if we do not decrease the rate at which we're adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere from our chimneys and tailpipes and so on, uh, the consequent rise in global average temperature during the 21st century is projected to be from 4.5 to 18 degrees Fahrenheit and will likely continue rising well beyond 2100. Sea level by 2100 likely to, to rise up to one foot. Uh, <clears throat> This, combined with likely increase in hurricane intensities, would have negative impacts on low-lying coastal regions. Um, there will be uh, likely lead to increases in extreme weather events, altered patterns of uh, rainfall, and, uh, and so on. It's a rather sobering uh, document, and the, uh, the authors conclude by saying there's also an as yet unquantifiable probability that continued greenhouse gas emissions will trigger abrupt climate change surprises. And they give them as an example of a surprise that we have seen in an area closely related to climate, the ozone hole, which wasn't predicted by models. The modelers who got the Nobel Prize had predicted a gradual decrease in ozone. The ozone hole itself um, was a surprise discovery. Very sobering assessment from, as I said, a group of prominent climate scientists uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, I've been uh, showing this uh, to illustrate the fact that you can get things technically right, but uh, nonetheless be, be misguided. I'm going to talk today about the science and about the public policy side. And on, this, on the, the, the interface between them, uh, there's an interesting organization called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC. And I'll have a good deal to say about it. But at the start, the lawyers have asked me to assure you that I'm speaking only for myself. There's a new IPCC report in the works. It's coming out uh, next year, in the early part of 2007. Uh, it's embargoed uh, now. Uh, we've been busy writing it for the last uh, three years. I'm familiar with it. I'm not going to say anything inconsistent with it. But I, I, I can't tell you that I'm speaking for the IPCC. As a starting point, I think we'll save ourselves a lot of time and energy if we agree on the kinds of truths about science that I've just read uh, from a group of distinguished scientists, which are, again, consistent with the IPCC report. Climate change is occurring. Uh, the observational evidence is all around us. We know through careful detective work that because of the patterns of climate change, the rates at which they're happening, the size of them, that it's primarily human beings that are responsible, particularly in the last few decades. So we are now up out of the audience onto the stage. All the things that always cause climate to change are still working. You know, the sun varies, the Earth's orbit varies, volcanoes go off, and so on. But now human beings are no longer passive spectators. And so we all, six and a half billion of us, are actors in this pageant. And we know, the IPCC has said uh, six years ago, and it's increasingly true today, that uh, the results that we're seeing, the changes in the climate we observe, are in fact predominantly um, human cause. I'm not going to show a whole lot of graphs, but here's one. Uh, this is the uh, record of temperature the surface temperature of the atmosphere and the top of the ocean uh, measured over uh, the instrumental period from the late 19th uh, century until today. And you can see it uh, rising. It's uh, calibrated in Celsius degrees, so multiply by nine-fifths to, uh, to get Fahrenheit. But you can see that <coughs> this is an anomaly, so the, the average uh, over the mid-20th century has been taken out here. You can see there was a rapid rise in the early part of the 20th century, a slight cooling from about the time of World War II into the 70s. And since the 1970s, a rapid rise, so that it's warmer now than it has been uh, during any other time during the instrumental record, globally speaking. Uh, it's probably warmer than it has been uh, for several centuries up to a millennium. We can compare this with proxy data for climate in the pre-instrumental period, tree rings, boreholes, corals, and so on. So we know that it is anomalously warm now. All the warmest years on record have been in the last two decades. They're in the 1990s and the first uh, part of the 21st century. So that's one piece of the puzzle. We don't see uh, evidence in the record for that kind of rapid rise uh, due to natural causes alone. Uh, the IPCC, I'll tell you right now, for those of you who uh, like to spend time on the web, puts out wonderful reports, and they're all available. The ones that you can get now are not the ones that are coming out next year, but the ones uh, right before that, and they're all from this uh, website. If it's an unfamiliar looking website, that's because CH is the French abbreviation for Switzerland, and the IPCC, like a lot of UN agencies, is headquartered in Geneva. 
I highly recommend this website to you. Uh, this is the last two uh, IPCC uh, reports, uh, two parts of the report that came out in 2001. The one down here, uh, labeled uh, the scientific basis, uh, deals with the consensus of the assessment of peer-reviewed published science uh, by hundreds of, of experts. Uh, the new version will have a 2007 date. That's the one I've been spending about half my time on for the last three years, uh, together with uh, over 100 other um, lead authors. So this is about a 1,000-page book. Uh, it'll be available also on the IPCC website next spring, published in hard copy by Cambridge University Press. You can buy this in print if you like. There's a summary for policymakers uh, that is drafted um, by a team of scientists, but then negotiated <laughs> word by word by government representatives in a remarkable session uh, resembling a mini United Nations General Assembly. Uh, they are uh, allowed to uh, change words and change emphasis because it's written for, um, for policymakers. That's the whole purpose of the IPCC. They're not allowed to say anything inconsistent with the science. So this plenary for the new report will take place in Paris next January and February, and we scientists will be there. Uh, so they can say that sea level rise is serious or critical or a matter of concern, but they can't say it's trivial or impossible. Uh, so that should be an interesting give and take, and I'm looking forward to it very much. I highly recommend these books to you. We use them as textbooks for graduate students uh, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. They're the nearest thing to a gold standard. They're the definitive, definitive authoritative um, <coughs> summary of climate change science. There are other reports uh, that deal with mitigation and adaptation. How do you reduce uh, emissions? Uh, how do you live with the inevitable climate change? Over time, the IPCC has put out three major reports. The first one, in 1990, simply said uh, this is a subject of concern. But by 1995, you can see this delicate uh, negotiated language. If this looks like lawyerly language, it's because a lot of very fine lawyers have been at it. And, uh, but in 2001, uh, we got from the governments, which, as you can imagine, bring very different perspectives to this uh, issue, that most of the warming over the last 50 uh, years is, uh, is human-caused. So that's uh, very much a consensus view right now. Because it's clear, has been clear for some time to the scientific community, it's becoming clearer to the policy world, uh, to the media, uh, to many corporations, and to many, many concerned individuals worldwide, uh, there's still uncertainty that one has to cope with. There's uncertainty in every area of science. When you go to your physician, uh, she uh, uh, can't say that medicine is complete and that nothing is uncertain. Uh, they haven't cured a lot of diseases yet. Nonetheless, the science of medicine is good enough to provide useful input to you, and so the science of climate is good enough to provide useful input uh, <coughs> to policymakers, despite the uncertainty. And the IPCC is very careful um, to, uh, <coughs> to make clear the degree of uncertainty. Here's another example of the uh, observational record. I showed you a graph of global average temperatures. Here's a map of how those temperatures look. The color code here is the darker the red, the greater the warming. And this compares the temperatures in the five most recent years, averaged, uh, with a base period in the mid to late uh, 20th century. And you can see here uh, that there's a pattern to things. There is uh, a warming over continents that's greater than over oceans. You see that especially uh, here in uh, Eurasia. You can see that the northern hemisphere has warmed more than the southern hemisphere. There are places like the Antarctic Peninsula here uh, that uh, have warmed significantly. But the strongest warming is in the far north. The Arctic is the canary in the coal mine here. And we know why the, the uh, models, uh, why the world has, has warmed more strongly in the Arctic. It's because of feedbacks, of complicated climate processes. So one of the things that happens in the Arctic is that as the world warms, because the greenhouse effect is getting stronger, the blanket that traps heat is getting better at trapping heat, um, snow and ice melt. As I just read you from the, the summary of the scientists, there's been substantial reduction in both sea ice and uh, ice on land and in glaciers. And uh, as that happens, the darker surface that's under where the ice or snow used to be absorbs more sunlight. It's less reflective. So warming darkens the far north. <coughs> that doesn't happen in Antarctica because the ice there is so thick. But in the far north, you get a positive feedback, that is, a, a warming that produces a process that adds to the warming. It's as though you had your house wired funny so that uh, uh, when it got hot, it turned on the furnace instead of the air conditioner. And uh, that's happening in the far north. So the, the system is you warm the world because you've strengthened the greenhouse effect, because you and I are putting carbon dioxide out of our chimneys and tailpipes. 
Every time you burn coal or oil or natural gas, you add to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The world warms. As it warms, some snow and ice melt. That darkens the surface, makes the far north less reflective, so it absorbs more sunlight than it did when it was cooler, and the absorbed sunlight adds to the warming. That's the main reason why you see this uh, warming in the far north. And if you've followed uh, newspapers and television, you know it has had uh, tremendous consequences. Uh, it has resulted in the, in the melting permafrost, so that in Alaska, for example, roads and buildings that are built on permafrost are, are uh, <coughs> no longer stable, and many other um, adverse consequences to marine life and so on. This is complicated. It challenges uh, policymakers, and I've put down on this slide two of the positions in the continuum of positions. There's a whole spectrum of opinions. Uh, the one uh, that goes first is that, that there's an emphasis on the precautionary principle, if you will. These people who believe in this, uh, uh, some argue uh, sentence, suggest that it's better um, even in the face of some uncertainty, even while the science is incomplete, as it will always be, um, to take some action, not to wait uh, longer. There's another, um, another perspective, and the bottom sentence uh, expresses that, which is that it's uh, complicated and can be costly uh, <coughs> to adapt uh, to weaning the world from fossil fuels or otherwise reducing uh, the rate at which we add carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And meanwhile, the risk of doing that ought to be manageable. It's not time to act yet. This is the most famous graph in earth science. This shows the carbon dioxide rising in the atmosphere. Um, this is a local product. This graph uh, grew out of the work of Charles David Keeling, who died last year, a chemist who spent all his uh, life uh, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, his entire career. He was brought here as a postdoctoral fellow in the 1950s by Roger Revelle, who was then director of Scripps and hadn't yet founded uh, UCSD. Um, there are many interesting stories about Keeling and, and Revelle. Keeling was a very stubborn fellow. Revelle said he had a gene for measuring carbon dioxide and was the most stubborn man he'd ever met. Uh, they disagreed uh, genially about uh, the best way to do this. But Keeling um, had invented the instrument to measure carbon dioxide. It wasn't possible before he measured it, before he invented the instrument. It's a very rare gas. Out of every million molecules of air, there are only 380 molecules um, that are carbon dioxide. The rise in uh, carbon dioxide from the late 50s when Keeling began his measurements till today, and by the way, today the measurements are being carried on others by others. There's a global network and so on. The rise is due entirely uh, to human activities, mainly burning fossil fuels, but also deforestation, <coughs> cement manufacture. We know that because for you chemists, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has a different isotopic signature depending on where it comes from. So we can distinguish CO2 made by human activities from other CO2. The data are so good that if you, uh, if you uh, take out these annual wiggles, the red uh, uh, <coughs> ups and downs every year, which are uh, shown here in more detail, if you take them out, uh, you can see things like the Arab oil embargo in the 1970s. That's this flattening out when there was temporarily less petroleum used uh, worldwide. You can see El Ninos, where the solubility of CO2 in the ocean changes. Carbon dioxide is rather benign gas, you know. It's, uh, it's what's in the bubbles in champagne or beer or, or soft drinks. Uh, it's tasteless, odorless, colorless, non-toxic, but it contributes to the greenhouse effect. And it's of the gases that human beings are affecting, uh, it's the most important one by far. The annual wiggles are due to the biosphere breathing. Every year, as the trees put out leaves and photosynthesize, they draw down the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They're turning that carbon into tree material. And in the fall, when the leaves fall off, the trees respire, the CO2 goes back in the atmosphere. So in this one single curve, you see the effect of human activities. This is substantial. The numbers on the right show that in, in 1958, when the, the chart begins, the number of CO2 molecules per million was 315, now it's uh, 380. We know what it was, by the way, in the 19th century before people started using fossil fuels because we've analyzed air bubbles trapped in ice and dated them. So it was 280. So it's gone from 280 to, uh, to 380, uh, uh, more than a third uh, kind of jump in, uh, in just uh, the space of a little over a century. So the rise is due to you and me. The wiggles are due to the interaction between the physical climate system and the world of living things. It follows the northern hemisphere seasons, by the way, because there's most of the land by far is in the north, so most of the trees are in the north. And furthermore, these data are representative of the whole world. 
Keeling won that argument with Ravel. Ravel wanted to put the instrument on a ship and do cruises in the traditional oceanographic way. Uh, Keeling, remember, it's a postdoc in his 20s arguing with a world-renowned scientist who was well over six feet tall and didn't have a mousy personality at all. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> Keeling said, no, 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 the CO2 stays in the atmosphere for decades to centuries, so if I measure it in one pristine location and do that right, it will be representative of the global concentration. And he was right. And that, by the way, has profound ge uh, geopolitical consequences today because uh, that means the CO2 overhead right now is not what was put into the atmosphere by California or La Jolla. It was what's put into the atmosphere by the whole world. It's been mixed around by the winds so that uh, countries uh, all experience the climatic effects regardless of who made the CO2. So that's an, one example of what policymakers have to cope with. And we'd like to think that wise policy in an area where technology matters so much and where there's so much technical substance ought to be informed by sound uh, science, but there isn't any single guru. Um, there's, uh, there's no oracle that uh, pronounces on the science in a way that everyone can agree on, and that's why the IPCC was established. It was put together nearly 20 years ago uh, to provide uh, policymakers uh, with input, to provide the science in a way that was relevant uh, to the needs of the policy world. It's been an extraordinary success. Um, it is uh, very highly regarded uh, worldwide, and that itself has had consequences that I'll come to as well. Here's an example of a policymaker's quandary, and incidentally, an insurance company's quandary, too. Um, this is Katrina. Now, I'll say right away that you can't say Katrina is a smoking gun. You can't say Katrina was, in some sense, caused by global warming. But you can say that in a warmer world, tropical cyclones, hurricanes in particular, which get their energy from the warm ocean, which only form uh, when the ocean is above a critical temperature, other things being equal, there will be a greater energy supply. And so there is research. It's a, it's a far from complete, still active area of research, but there is research that suggests that uh, hurricanes in a warmer world should become stronger, in particular that the strongest hurricanes might be strongest, might be more strong, and that there's evidence because hurricanes have been observed now for many decades, there is evidence that this may be happening at least in some parts of the world. As I said, the, uh, <coughs> the word is far from, from being said finally. We don't have all the results we'd like to yet. But if you're contemplating running a reinsurance company and wondering about, uh, about your risk to hurricanes, uh, then you can look at Katrina as an example and, and ask yourself, is this a foretaste of the future? Are we more likely to see these things? It should be said, by the way, that most hurricane damage, that, which has gone up rapidly in recent decades, is doing simply to have, due simply to having more assets, more people, more valuable property uh, in hurricane-prone areas. I'll have more to say about hurricanes later on. There are two uh, agencies. The uh, WMO is an old meteorological agency, been around forever, used to be concerned with dull things like standardizing thermometers around the world and UNEP, which has a broad environmental charter. The IPCC is governmental and scientific. The scientists work for free, by the way. I mean, they pay our plane tickets and so on, but nothing goes in your pocket if you work for IPCC. It's public service. And the governments are very much in charge of what's done. So there's a certain rigid bureaucracy. There's a forest of, uh, of acronyms. And there's a clash of culture. You know, when scientists go to meetings, they wear uh, scruffy clothes and they argue about things. And then afterwards, they go have a beer. Uh, the government meetings, on the other hand, are all business wear, parliamentary procedure, great formality, uh, and uh, great uh, civil courtesy compared to science meetings. You, you don't even feel the knife sliding between your ribs. <laughs> the IPCC doesn't conduct research, although interestingly enough, it has come to influence the research that's conducted. The first IPCC report, the 1991, was really, you might say, a pure review of the existing scientific literature. But as time has gone on, more and more research is being done because the IPCC is thought to need the results. So you will hear scientists say, I've got to get my model running because you know, the IPCC deadline is uh, so and so. And uh, it has a lot of noble words in its mandate here. You can see comprehensive, objective, open, uh, transparent. And it's supposed to report in ways that are relevant to policy, but that are not driven by or prescriptive of policy. So the IPCC doesn't advise governments or anybody else what to do. It just summarizes the science so they can mix that in with everything else that goes into the decision. Here's an example of a piece of science that the IPCC has assessed. Mount Pinatubo was the biggest volcano by far in modern times. 
and uh, it <coughs> began to decrease the temperature in the atmosphere right away because it put a huge amount of stuff of small particles of various kinds up into the high atmosphere, including the lower stratosphere, where it spread around the world, blocked sunlight, and caused a cooling. And a uh, climate research group, several actually, but I'm showing the results of one, predicted, and these are two sets of dotted and dashed lines showing their predictions with two models or assumptions, uh, that the, uh, the uh, <coughs> temperature would fall very substantially. This is six-tenths of a degree Celsius, about one degree Fahrenheit, over a year or so, and then over the next five years or so would gradually recover. This was an honest forecast made before the fact, made at about this point here. And these, the blue data, are the measurements, and indeed, um, the uh, real world behaved much like the forecast said it would. It's many examples like this that give us confidence in the models because the same computer simulation is used to make these kinds of predictions that are used to forecast the behavior of the climate. There have been three assessment reports so far, and as I said, a fourth one uh, coming uh, out next uh, year. Each includes summaries for policymakers, which are uh, only a few pages long, um, published in all Sikh language. If you want to brush up on your Arabic, this is your chance. Uh, the first assessment report was influential uh, in uh, causing the governments of the world to sign on to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change at the Earth Summit in Rio, which you may remember, the largest gathering of heads of state and probably paparazzi in the world. The first President Bush signed for the U.S., the Congress ratified it. The objective of the Framework Convention is to stabilize the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at a level that is not dangerous. Dangerous was not defined then and hasn't been defined since, but the goal is there. That so the U.S. and virtually every other country in the world is a signatory to a solemn international undertaking, and the uh, countries that sign this meet every year. They've just finished meeting in Nairobi, for example. The most famous of the uh, meetings, these annual meetings, which are called conferences of the parties. You're, what you're a party to is that framework convention. And the, the conferences of the parties met in Kyoto, in 1997, and by that time, the second IPCC report um, had come. The, that's the one that had the lawyerly language about discernible human influence on climate. That's where the Kyoto Protocol was formulated. The Kyoto Protocol is now in force. It had for a long time been thought it wouldn't come into force because of the refusal of the U.S. and a couple of other uh, big emitting countries to sign. There was a complicated formula for how many and what kind of countries totaling how much of the world's emissions of CO2 had to sign. But to everyone's surprise, um, Russia uh, ratified it uh, for various reasons, and uh, therefore it came into force uh, not quite two years ago. So it's in force now, and although the U.S. isn't formally a signatory to it, it's affected by it. So for example, a U.S. multinational corporation with a branch in, a, in another country uh, has to abide by the emissions uh, regulations there. So it's in effect, it's a small first step. If everybody signed Kyoto and nobody cheated, it would slightly reduce the rate at which emissions are being added to the atmosphere. Um, it's as though what you wanted to do was uh, to cut way back on uh, eating so that you uh, stopped gaining weight and began to lose. You're still gaining it now if you think of weight as being like CO2 concentrations, but just at a slightly lesser uh, rate than before. But it's a first step. It brings people to the table. It gets uh, the diplomacy going. Uh, I showed you a picture before of how the climate has changed in the last few years and here's a computer projection from the most recent IPCC report, the 2001 report, uh, showing how the computer models, which there are quite a few now, predicted the world would change under a particular scenario. You don't want to know what these terms tell you. I'll tell you one of them, and then you won't ask me to tell you any of the others. S-R-E-S-A-2, pronounced S-R-E-S, A-2, is the Special Report on Emissions Scenarios, scenario number A-2, which is a forecast, a kind of business-as-usual prediction of how much CO2 would be added under given assumptions for population and the use of fossil fuels. Um, and so under this scenario, so it's not a prediction of what the real world will do, it's a what-if experiment. If this much CO2 is emitted and other things happen, how will the climate change? And as you can see down here, what you're looking at is the temperature change in the last part of the current century relative to 1990, and although the, the numbers here are different from the ones we saw before, they're again in Celsius degrees, and the darker the red, the greater the warming, you can see the similarities in pattern. Just as in the observations, there's more warming over North America than in the surrounding oceans. The land warms more than the ocean. After all, that makes a certain amount of sense. When you warm the atmosphere over land, you're only warming the top bit of soil. When you warm the ocean, you have great depth of water to warm takes a long time. And you see that, again, that over Eurasia, there's more warming predicted by this model 
uh, <coughs> than over the surrounding oceans, more warming in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere, greatest warming in the far <laughs> north because of this ice-snow reflectivity feedback uh, that I mentioned. It's this sort of similarity between the footprint of climate change that we observe, the picture I showed earlier, and the model prediction of climate change that we simulate under given assumption. Many, many, many of this kind of uh, picture involving not just temperature but many other climate variables, rainfall for example, that makes the community, this research community, more and more confident that uh, we are indeed seeing in the real world the, for the, uh, the fulfillment, you might say, the, uh, <coughs> of the, the forecasts that had been made with computer models. It's the similarity between the rates, magnitudes, patterns of climate change from our best computer model predictions. And these models are very complicated programs, uh, hundreds of thousands of lines of code that in embody, incorporate all our best understanding of climate physics. And as I said, there are lots of models around the world now. If you like this stuff, if you want a, a, a website, I highly recommend realclimate.org. Um, Real Climate is uh, not uh, put together by uh, propagandists or lobbyists for any concern. It's put together by climate scientists. It's invitational. You can't write an article for realclimate.org unless you're uh, a climate scientist. It's self-regulating, you might say. And so I'm just giving you my personal opinion that the scientists who who do maintain this uh, site quite selflessly and very attractively, by the way. It's a searchable site and uh, you know, it looks like a professional web design. Uh, it, it is an up to the minute um, and very interesting, sometimes rather technical, uh, discussion of climate change on a rapid response time scale. After all, uh, these people can post an article overnight, whereas the IPCC takes six years to write its next report. I caution you that there's a blogger component to this. So anybody and everybody uh, can write in and comment on the, uh, uh, on the, the articles that the scientists uh, post. And as you know with the web, you can find anything you want and there's no quality control. So uh, my judgment is that the articles by the scientists are good. Um, use caution uh, when looking at the, the bloggers who uh, anybody and any, anybody can write in. Well, as I said, the, there's now consensus in the science community. Um, the, uh, there's a great deal of agreement uh, I'm seeing a rapid change in the way the media uh, treat this issue, not simply the headline stories. Uh, Time and Newsweek have featured global warming on their covers this year, for example, but in the assumptions underlying the journalism, in the way the issues are framed. So, for example, there's much less of the some scientists think that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Well, actually, they all do, you know. Uh, it's a good way to tell a scientist from somebody else. And, uh, <laughs> and there have been parallel examples so that, uh, for example, there are, there are uh, people who disagree with the consensus that uh, HIV causes AIDS, but you don't see uh, an AIDS story framed in terms of that some people think, most scientists don't, and so on. And so that for many, many mainstream media outlets now, both print and broadcast, you are seeing uh, the assumption, uh, often explicitly written, that this problem is real, it's significant. We are increasing the greenhouse effect. Climate is changing, we see it now. Humans uh, are the cause. And we are seeing in many countries and in many states and municipalities in the US, not so much from the federal side, um, the beginning of action. So for example, the California legislature passed this year and Governor Schwarzenegger signed a Kyoto-like um, binding agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for California. Um, Mayor Sanders in San Diego recently signed on to a uh, U.S. mayor's uh, statement on climate change. And you see that kind of action taking place uh, at, at the business level, too. This is the busiest uh, graph, but I couldn't resist showing it to you. These pie charts up here are rather similar, and they all show the amount of carbon dioxide under different uh, conditions. The first one on the left is the carbon dioxide emitted over 250 years. Obviously, it's an estimate. You still you see the USA at about uh, between 25 and 30 percent, China, Russia, Germany, United Kingdom, and so on. If you look at what was in the air in 2005, um, the USA is responsible for a little bit less than uh, the total emissions because there's been uh, emissions growth from other countries. And if you look at currently what's going on in 2005, the US emission was 20 and a half percent of the global total. China was up to 18 percent. It's a forecast that China will pass the US as the net uh, largest emitter of CO2. Here are those same countries ranked in the order of emissions. So the USA 
ranked on the left, China next, Russia. So they're ranked in the order of the size of the pie. Um, <clears throat> but what's shown in the bars here is the amount emitted per capita, how much each person is responsible to on average. And you can see that in these uh, units, which are metric tons per year per person, uh, each person in the United States is responsible for between five and six, each person in China less than one. And similarly for India, which is the other country, and generally the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, developing countries with large populations, have low per capita emissions but rapid growth. And that's the great risk. That's an example of what I meant when I said this is an in inherently international problem and the geopolitics means that all countries of the world have to take action because as these countries with large populations grow, as they develop their economies, if they do so on the Western model, you know, globally 80% of global energy is generated by fossil fuels today. The rest is nuclear, renewables, and so on. If they uh, industrialize on that model, and China is building a coal-fired power plant, a big one, about once a week now, they have a large supply of coal, um, then uh, you exacerbate this problem enormously. So no single country uh, can take action. It will require action from many countries. There is a group of people, they like to call themselves skeptics. That's an honorable term in science. All scientists are skeptical of received wisdom. You know, if a <laughs> guy next door publishes a paper, I'll be at his throat the next day saying, well, does it agree with my theory? Uh, and, uh, but there are people that are not so much skeptics as devoted to trying to disprove or cast doubt on the established, settled science. And I and others have begun to call them denialists. They're, they're in denial of, uh, of the science that the great majority of the reputable science community uh, <coughs> takes as having been settled. The IPCC reports, by the way, have been vetted by every possible conceivable source. All the professional societies of scientists, uh, all the important ones worldwide, the National Academy of Sciences in the US, its counterparts in 10 other countries, and so on. Um, and there is a disinformation campaign, rather similar uh, to the one uh, mounted by parts of the tobacco industry, uh, trying to cast doubt on the idea that smoking and health were, were connected. And because it's not possible to refute the science, uh, a, an explicit uh, uh, objective of this disinformation campaign is simply to create the impression of disunity and uncertainty and wrangling among, among scientists. Doubt is our product is a slogan uh, from a tobacco company that was uncovered when the tobacco lawsuits got access to the uh, internal <coughs> records of tobacco companies. In some cases, it's the very same people um, that are involved. I don't like the term global warming for two reasons. One is global, the other is warming, because uh, what happens is local, if it's important, and it's often com uh, not confined to warming. In a, some sense, the warming is a symptom, the way fever is a symptom of illness. But we can say that heat waves will be more likely. That's serious. There was a heat wave in this country last summer. There was a heat wave that killed 35,000 people in Europe in 2003. The research done on these heat waves indicates that in a warmer world, they become simply uh, less improbable. So the 100-year event might become the 10-year event. Hurricanes, I've already mentioned, and we'll say more about them. I think that for California and many other areas that depend on snowpack, water supply is a big uh, risk area. We already see a reduction in Sierra snowpack. We already see it melting earlier in the water year, being released from the system of uh, dams uh, and levees and so on for flood control, so less is available. So we can forecast more, um, more controversy over water usage, uh, greater risk of water shortage. And sea level um, will rise. I'll say more about sea level in a moment, but it's not rocket science. The ocean uh, expands as it gets warmer, like many other things. And in addition, more water flows into the ocean from melting ice on land. And there's a, <coughs> the New York Times today mentioned a report in Science Magazine this week's issue that extreme weather will intensify. So there'll be more gully washers and less drizzle, if you want to put it that way. And that's been happening in India, for example, and in parts of the United States. Here's an example of sea level rise for three West Coast cities. You can see there's a lot of interannual variability uh, these graphs uh, start before uh, World War II and continue to near the present. But you can see that there's a rate of rise of about an inch uh, per decade. And uh, that has serious consequences for beach erosion, uh, for uh, uh, saltwater intrusion into estuaries. I think that for an area like San Diego, sea level rise and uh, water supply disruption are two major issues. The, the comments I, re I read to you at the beginning from the amicus brief to the U.S. Supreme Court by climate scientists 
talked about surprises, the possibility of thresholds or instabilities or tipping points. And here's one that's been looked into recently. In Greenland, it turns out that meltwater from the surface flows in many places down through deep crevasses called moulins to the bottom and lubricate the base where the ice sheet is grounded against bedrock. And uh, so it looks like the melting of Greenland, and there's paleo evidence from the geological past that this has happened in the past, uh, can uh, happen suddenly, that melting can happen suddenly. If you melted all of Greenland, I'm not forecasting that anytime soon, you get over 20 feet of sea level rise. And we know sea level was much higher in geologically warm periods in the past. We see corals, for example, many feet above present sea level. And so there is evidence that this is one of those kinds of tipping points, perhaps analogous to the ozone hole, where a gradual process um, suddenly uh, puts the climate system into another regime. A bit like a light switch. You push against it, you push against it, it resists, and then it clicks and flips over into another regime. Here is a map of uh, areas especially vulnerable. You can see they're all over. They're in the U.S., they're on the Gulf Coast and East Coast, uh, where there are many areas of low-lying land. But you see this, too, in, in Europe, in the low countries uh, here in the Middle East. This is Bangladesh, and this is uh, northeastern China. There are many parts of the world that are, are extremely vulnerable to, uh, to sea level rise. Um, this is Hurricane Linda in 1997, a Category 5 hurricane, the most uh, ferocious hurricane ever observed in the Eastern Pacific. And I show it to you because it was forecast for a while to uh, uh, come to San Diego. There was actually a hurricane once in San Diego, a little one, Category 1, 19th century. It's been uh, put together from newspaper reports. But in general, we don't get hurricanes. Linda, like most Baja hurricanes, went northwest out to sea and dissipated in, over colder water. But as the waters warm and the oceans of the world are warming, again in a way consistent with the models, um, it's quite possible that the regions uh, vulnerable to hurricanes um, will alter. So here's an example of something that may be a, a surprise or a threshold or, or a tipping point. You don't have to get hit by more than one serious hurricane to gain a healthy respect for them. I'm about done now. I've, I've been given a time limit. I'm going to obey it. There are things that people can do. There are solutions. I'm a technological optimist. I think that if the world collectively took this issue as seriously as it deserves and freed up the creativity of bright engineers to look at energy alternatives, uh, freed up uh, the creativity of entrepreneurs in, in the commercial world, uh, there's lots that could be done. Whether I'm an optimist politically is another story. But <coughs> I think my advice to people, this applies to school children, it applies to members of Congress, is to accept the facts, learn the facts, uh, to ignore the denialists, there's uh, just some noise there. There is settled science. This problem is not going to go away. Uh, it's uh, real, it's uh, serious, and to take action that's meaningful, um, the action has to be international and has to be coordinated. No one single country uh, solves the problem, but a wealthy, technologically advanced uh, country with uh, a great deal of clout, like the United States, can do a great deal. And some of it can be profitable. Uh, needless to say, Toyota is selling all the Priuses um, it can make. If you uh, switch to a, uh, to a fuel-efficient car, um, if everybody switches to a fuel-efficient car, you put money in your pocket, you reduce smog, you reduce your balance of payments problems, and so on. So there are many win-win uh, things, and not everything is costly, but there's a great need for political uh, leadership. In that sense, I agree very much uh, with Al Gore's movie, uh, an inconvenient truth. Uh, it's uh, technically pretty good. I could quibble about a detail or two, but as a primer on the global warming issue, it's pretty accurate. And I tell people who, uh, who uh, aren't partial to Al Gore, pretend it's another narrator, somebody you like. Uh, Trevor Hoffman, for example. I mean. <laughs> um, in the next IPCC report, I see several issues, and perhaps we can discuss them uh, later. One is that it's already clear uh, that there are uh, there is a lack of unanimity, especially on the, uh, on the political side. So I'm uh, looking forward uh, to the education I expect to get at the IPCC plenary in Paris in early 2007, uh, because um, Saudi Arabia and a small island nation might have very different perspectives on the, the climate change uh, uh, issue. The IPCC, incidentally, has been uh, so successful 
uh, that uh, people with interests in other worthy areas, whether it's north-south equity issues or women's health or many other issues, are thinking, well, we've got a mechanism that works now. Let's expand the IPCC. Uh, it's done climate. Let's have it do uh, something else. So there's a, there's a threat to divert the IPCC uh, to, have it, to broaden its charter. I think uh, the disinformation campaign is going to ramp up. Uh, I can already tell you uh, that I've seen evidence that uh, people who would like to disparage the new IPCC report are trolling in the research community with $10,000 honoraria looking for scientists who will write hostile reviews, for example, of the IPCC report and planning anti-IPCC press conferences. So, so you're going to see some, some ugly uh, controversy there. I've mentioned uh, Gore's movie. There's a lot of, uh, of other uh, good information out there. I've given you a couple of websites. HBO made a film called Too Hot Not to Handle that I had a part in and, and recommend. Um, I think uh, Gore, you know, is also uh, in some ways a Scripps product. I think many of you have heard the story when Roger Revelle, after founding UCSD, wasn't made its first chancellor. He went off to Harvard, where he did many good things, <coughs> founded a population program, and also taught a young undergraduate named Al Gore. And uh, so uh, Gore has uh, acknowledged many times that it was Ravel's interest in climate that first captured his attention. And you know, e regardless of how you feel about Gore politically, uh, you have to respect the fact that uh, long before he was vice president, while he was still in Congress, he was studying uh, climate. His uh, first book, Earth and the Balance, was, was written uh, before he was elected uh, vice president. Uh, so he's learned a great deal, and so he's an example of someone, again, you don't have to agree with uh, every political stand he takes or every remedy he proposes, um, but he's an example of a layperson who has become very well informed, and I think that's really the key. I think that the kind of concerted action that I'm speaking of, the leadership from the government side, will come about, um, especially in an advanced Western democracy like the U.S., uh, when an educated electorate uh, tells the people who are looking for votes, this issue is important to me, it's important to my kids, it's important to my grandchildren, do something about it. Thank you. Is there a group of scientists in China that people, the scientists here in America can be in contact with? Usually scientists are already in contact with each other. The question was about uh, whether there are scientists in, in China that we are in contact with or could be, and the answer is very much so. Uh, China has a very active research community in this area. In fact, uh, the IPCC uh, working group concerned with the climate system has two co-chairs. One is an American chemist, uh, she works in Colorado, and one is a Chinese uh, meteorologist, uh, and uh, he works in Beijing. And uh, he uh, is the head of an enormous research community uh, in China, which is very actively uh, engaged. And uh, the Chinese government also uh, cares a great deal about this uh, topic. Doctor, would you uh, trace, I'm here. Doctor, would you trace for us the uh, position of the Bush administration on the Kyoto Accords and Protocol? I mean, what, what are the pros and cons about their position? What is their current position? The, uh, History of the Kyoto Protocol, the question is how the Bush administration feels about it. Uh, the, in the United States, uh, the country not only hasn't ratified uh, Kyoto, although it was very active in the negotiations that produced uh, Kyoto, uh, and uh, the uh, apathy towards Kyoto uh, predates the Bush administration. So that, for example, the Clinton administration did not bring the Kyoto uh, Protocol to the uh, Senate for ratification because the Senate, in a near unanimous uh, vote, had said it wasn't interested in ratifying something unless uh, developing countries also had emissions restrictions. Kyoto uh, was uh, designed to put emissions restrictions first on the developed countries and later on developing countries. And uh, that uh, has been the position of the Bush administration as well. The Bush administration pre-September 11th was very seriously concerned about uh, climate change. There were cabinet level briefings by climate uh, scientists. Um, but that, uh, that effort has not, in my judgment, um, been maintained. The position of the Bush administration is that it would like to reduce uh, the carbon intensity of American industry. That means that for a given amount of energy or a given amount of GDP, uh, they'd like to see a reduction in CO2 emissions. That's already happening. It's already happening naturally. For example, if you as a businessman or a business owner uh, make your business more energy efficient or conserve more energy, 
which uh, is something you'd like to do anyway, just for economic grounds, that does reduce the carbon intensity of the, of the economy. So the world is slowly decarbonizing, but unfortunately, the economy is also growing, so that emissions are in fact going up. In order to stabilize the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, you have to reduce the rate at which you add CO2 to about the rate that natural processes remove it over a long time. And that requires not a reduction of a few percent, which was the Kyoto target, but a reduction that's massive, that might be 70 or 80 percent. Depends on things we're not quite sure of about how the natural world cycles carbon. And uh, the, none of the uh, Bush administration proposals uh, have been aimed at that. And uh, so that's what I mean when I talk about taking the issue seriously. Uh, you have to be quantitative about this. The science teaches you that. And uh, Kyoto, as I said, would have been only a first step, even if it were universally adopted and no one cheated. But um, once you've rejected it, it seems to me that it's incumbent uh, to propose something else, uh, to uh, uh, take leadership on that. And I think we're still waiting for the U.S. at the federal level to do that. There's been progress uh, in the corporate world and in states and municipalities. But uh, in my judgment, the federal government has not taken the leadership role that this issue deserves. Which leads me to ask you about admissions credit trading. Even though you set a cap in a region, I have a hard time understanding how this is going to reduce the impacts on global warming. The, the question was whether a cap and trade uh, system to restrict emissions can reduce uh, global warming. And it depends on the details. It depends on how it's implemented. Kyoto is a cap and trade system, and many of the annual conferences of the party since Kyoto, which after all is nearly 10 years old now, have been designed to flesh out the details of how the caps and trades would work. Indeed, you're right. If uh, you simply trade so that uh, a CO2 molecule that you would have emitted in Chicago now gets emitted in Buenos Aires, you haven't done any good. And uh, so, uh, it depends on the details. The devil is all in the nuances of, of how that is implemented. We know, however, cap-and-trade systems have worked in the past as per in for some other problems, particularly transborder air pollution. You know, that has been a successful uh, story. So I'm not opposed to it. I'm not particularly gung-ho about it. It's one of a number of, of arrows in the quiver. But whether it has the desired effect of reducing the net emissions of carbon dioxide uh, depends on exactly how it's done. If you had the power, for instance, as president, what initiatives would you put forward and try and get uh, implemented in the next, uh, say, one to five years? If I were president, what would I do? Well, <laughs> run, run screaming back to UCSD, I think. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, one of the things you can do um, at a governmental level, it requires uh, presidential but also uh, congressional leadership, it seems to me, is uh, to relook at uh, what you tax and what you subsidize. And so I am in favor, I'm not running for office, mind you, so I can say this bluntly, I'm in favor of a carbon tax. And I am open-minded about whether it's imposed at the wellhead or at the gas pump. I'm open-minded about um, how you make it uh, revenue neutral, if you wish, uh, how you reward people who would be punished uh, by what is, after all, a sales tax. Um, but uh, right now, we subsidize um, fossil fuel in this country. You don't pay at the gas pump for the respiratory illness that uh, happens in LA. And uh, in Europe, uh, gas costs roughly twice what it costs here, and people pay it, and they've adapted. Uh, the difference is tax. Everybody pays the oil producers the same amount for a barrel of crude. And so the Europeans simply tax, this is true throughout Western Europe, tax um, gasoline much more heavily than the United States uh, does. And people drive smaller cars. They live closer to work. Uh, some of that money has built uh, mass transport. Some of these uh, things don't immediately carry over to a big country like the US, for example. But I think uh, it's, it's the right way to go. I think. Uh, uh, taxing what you, after all, we encourage home ownership by giving people a mortgage break on their income tax. So if you want to subsidize what uh, your judgment of societal good is, and you want to uh, uh, basically uh, discourage people from behaving conversely, uh, there are plenty of ways in the, in the tax code to do that. And I think the other thing is simply uh, to declare uh, this a major national priority. It ought to be a non-partisan, uh, non-controversial goal, motherhood, apple pie, uh, 
uh, environment, uh, <coughs> economic prosperity and you know, secure uh, defense and all the rest, and uh, a better climate. Does anybody particularly want to uh, leave a damaged planet to their children? I don't think so. And so once it's a national priority, there are all kinds of incentives you can provide to uh, industries, for example, uh, to develop uh, what needs to be done. Energy efficiency, energy conservation, greater reliance on uh, renewables and, uh, and so on, in including uh, biofuels and carbon sequestration. There are all kinds of things one can work on. You can work harder at the uh, next major breakthrough, the hydrogen economy or fusion or whatever um, your pet is. I think uh, there's a lot can be done in many areas. You know, um, France generates 80% of its electricity from nuclear power. In the U.S., since Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, nuclear power is uh, a political impossibility. There are no plants on the drawing board. Um, but you can look at how, what other countries have done and try to see whether it, it makes sense. I'm no great fan of nuclear power, but after all, the, the objections to it are well known. It's costly, there's a waste disposal issue, there's a reactor safety issue, and there's a proliferation issue. And I think if you free up creative engineers and entrepreneurs, you can make progress on all those issues. And I think people who've looked most carefully at the energy uh, problem in the light of climate change have said there's no single magic bullet, but there are things that can be done in all these areas, and they sum up uh, to what needs to be done, which is basically to wean the world away from the present uh, tendency to use fossil fuels as the basis of the global energy system. That requires political leadership. So I do all that in my first hundred days. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, let's thank Dr. Somerville.